Coming up in today's newscast, mourners gather to memorialize the victims of the Pittsburgh Tree of Life synagogue shooting. Israel sells advanced intelligence capabilities and spyware to Saudi Arabia, and Israel takes gold in a history-making judo match. Everyone is still reeling from Saturday's massacre at the Squirrel Hill Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, where 11 congregants were murdered and six more people, including four police officers, were injured. Thousands gathered for candlelit vigils, community members laid wreaths, and worldwide support and solidarity for Pittsburgh was expressed. The names of the victims, all aged between 54 and 97, have since been released, and among them are a pair of brothers and a married couple. They are Joyce Feinberg, 75, of Oakland City, Pittsburgh, Richard Gottfried, 65, of Ross Township, Rose Mallinger, 97, of Squirrel Hill, Pittsburgh, Jerry Rabinowitz, 66, of Edgewood Borough, Cecil Rosenthal, 59, and his brother David, 54, of Squirrel Hill, Bernice Simon and her husband Sylvan, 84 and 86, of Wilkinsburg, David Stein, 71, of Squirrel Hill, Melvin Wax, 88, of Squirrel Hill, and finally Irving Younger, 69, of Mount Washington City, Pittsburgh. In Jerusalem, a tribute video was displayed on the old city walls, and during the weekly security cabinet meeting on Sunday, Prime Minister Netanyahu led the room in a moment of silence. Even Israel's ultra-Orthodox Chief Rabbi David Lau spoke out against the attack, saying, quote, any murder of a Jew in any center of the world because they are Jewish is unforgivable. This despite Lau refusing to acknowledge that the Tree of Life Synagogue was even a synagogue, instead referring to it as, quote, a place of clear Jewish character, end quote. But unfortunately, many report feeling even more divided than ever after this attack and not together. First, this incident is far from having occurred in a vacuum. According to a Pittsburgh Jewish Chronicle report, between January and September this year, over 50 anti-Semitic incidents were reported in Pittsburgh alone, most in the very same Squirrel Hill neighborhood. Additionally, the terrorist Robert Bowers did subscribe to alt-right and neo-Nazi ideologies, and in the aftermath of his shooting that left 11 dead and 6 wounded, some in the American political left went as far as blaming the victims and the Trump administration's policies on Israel as justification for the heinous terror attack. Julia Laffey, a reporter from GQ magazine, for example, tweeted, quote, A word to my fellow American Jews, this president makes this possible, here where you live. I hope the embassy move over there, in Israel, where you don't live, was worth it." End quote. Lafay later deleted the post, but then followed it up with a full article defending her statement. Similarly, The Atlantic published its own piece blaming Jewish conservative and Republican voters, saying that, quote, "...any strategy for enhancing the security of American Jewry should involve shunning Trump's Jewish enablers. Their money should be refused, their presence in synagogues not welcome. They have placed their community in danger." End quote. A chant of vote, vote, vote broke out during a mourners gathering as well, but regardless of political affiliation, the suggestion that anyone deserves death for their ideas in the democratic political spectrum is abhorrent, vile, and in this case, horribly anti-Semitic. Palestinian health ministry officials are reporting today that three boys aged 12 to 14 were killed last night by an Israeli airstrike in the Gaza Strip. The IDF at the same time is claiming that they struck three male targets who were in the midst of placing an explosive device on the border fence. To date, since the conflict along the Gaza border escalated in March, 216 Palestinians have been killed by Israeli forces in similar circumstances, while Palestinians launched rockets and incendiary balloons into Israeli communities, threw stones and Molotov cocktails at the border and at IDF troops, and otherwise attempted to damage or infiltrate the border. One Israeli soldier was also killed by sniper fire. Israeli officials claim that the use of deadly force is necessary to prevent infiltration and further attacks. But that's not enough for southern Israeli citizens, who have for years suffered the brunt of Palestinian aggression. Residents from communities along the Gaza border came together this morning to block the Kerem Shalom crossing into Gaza from taking in aid to the Palestinians. When open, the crossing sees an average of 800 truckfuls of goods entering the Strip each day. But despite aid and fuel going into the Strip, only terror seems to come out, leading protesters to hold similar demonstrations over the past few days as well. This also comes just days after rocket fire was again initiated from Gaza, leaving just about no one trusting that the ceasefire reached afterwards with Hamas and the Palestinian Islamic Jihad will hold. Stepping away now from the Palestinian Authority and Gaza, after multiple official and unofficial Israeli government trips to Arab states in the region, some semblance of peace in the Middle East seems to be within reach, but unfortunately just not yet with the Palestinians. 
So the question is, how far can diplomacy really go between Israel and her neighbors before the Israeli-Palestinian conflict gets in the way? Here to discuss is Brigadier General Ram Shmueli, former head of Israeli Air Force Intelligence and chairman of HaShomer Chadash. Ram, thank you so much for coming back into the studio again. All right. So let's just write, write to the main question. Is it possible? How, how, how close can we get to our Arab neighbors before, before we get to this issue? First of all, I want to, to share my sympathy and thought mm -hmm. with uh, the people, the community, our brother and sister in Pittsburgh. About your question, it's always about interest. And uh, I can remember back in 1995, when there was a big interest for Turkey, those days the biggest uh, Muslim country, to go closer to the U.S. So they start some training with the Israeli Air Force, and I was sent to Turkey in order to build those relationships. Mm -hmm. So it's always a question of interest. So today we meet those interests of the Saudi Arabia, Oman, Qatar in a way. Uh, so those mutual interests are coming from uh, defense needs and economy. If it is defense needs, we all face the Shia threat and the nuclear threat from Iran. Mm -hmm. And in that regard, they don't, those countries find Israel as a good partner. First of all, because Israel confront uh, Iranian uh, nuclear uh, uh, project mm -hmm. on one hand. But secondly, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu and the government of Israel are very in close co uh, relationship with uh, President Trump. Mm -hmm. So those bring us together. The issue about the Palestinians, uh, they have to monitor very carefully in order for them, for their people, let's say in Saudi Arabia, in Oman, to support the government. Hey, you, you are talking with Israel. What's happened? Why you told us that it, uh, those are the devil. What about the Palestinian issue? They, they even monitor the so, declaration in the mosque. So what, what, what would happen, I mean, what, what's the worst that could happen if the leaders in Oman, Saudi Arabia, UAE, came out and said, yes, you know what, we're talking to Israel, our interests, as you say, align, so we still have solidarity with the Palestinians, we still want them to have their own state, yada yada, but, you know, but yes, we're talking with Israel. What's the worst that could happen? It is a, a, a challenge for them and the way for them to, uh, to control the public awareness is to stop the incitement. So we find a lot of sensors that tell us that the incitement, in, incitement mm -hmm. inside the mosques, the incitement inside the school in those countries are going very down. Mm. Unlike in Palestine. Sure, in Palestine, in, the in incitement Gaza. is going for the last 25 years. It haven't stopped yet. So if you find those sensors that the incitement are monitored by the government, they, it means that they are very serious. They are serious because we have this line of interest, both, sure. uh, uh, both military threat, the threat Saudi sure. and Oman and Israel, but also economy and connection with the United States of America. All right, well, Brigadier General, thank you so much for sharing your insights with us again today. It's an opportunity, yeah. and we, and our government we should take, uh, it. Yes, take it, and it's good, good for Israel. Thank you so much for coming in. All right, speaking of relationships in the Middle East, Israel and Saudi Arabia have long been in the headlines for their not-so-secret diplomacy, and according to new reports by the United Arab Emirates news website Al Khalij, Israel and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia have now also just signed a $250 million deal which includes Israeli spy technologies. This while the world is revisiting its associations with the Sauds over their alleged assassination of Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi. ILTV correspondent Yael Shir joins us with more. Now, Yael, I guess let's start from there. You know, what updates can you tell us about the Khashoggi case and, and how they play out in regards to Israel? Well, Aaron, there's a reason why experts have said that the Khashoggi's murder has been detrimental to Israel. And it's not just the fact that Saudi Arabia is a key player in Trump's peace plan of the century, which he has yet to unveil. Israel also has stronger ties to Saudi Arabia than previously thought. A tarnished image for Saudi Arabia could, in fact, impact Israel in the long run. And, and so what's the direct relationship then? Well, as you said, it's been reported that Israel sold highly advanced spy technologies to the kingdom, which were estimated at $250 million. But apparently some of these highly sophisticated systems have already been transferred to Saudi Arabia and are in use. 
Uh, so Israel and Saudi Arabia's strengthening ties are ongoing and in large part due to the growing Iranian threat in the region. Saudi Arabia fears Iran's dominance in the region just as much as Israel does. And Khashoggi was critical of this relationship then. Exactly. So Khashoggi, who had ties to the Muslim Brotherhood, was not a supporter of Israel at all. Um, he once tweeted that the Jews are without history in Palestine and invented the Wailing Wall. He also criticized uh, Saudi Arabia's cooperation with Israel and said that any ties with Israel would destroy Saudi Arabia's reputation in the Arab world. So, okay, then as cynical as this question may be, how does Khashoggi's murder potentially hurt ties between the two countries? Well, Aaron, while Israel's standing in the region could be boosted by a strong alliance with Saudi Arabia, the Saudi crown prince has shown that he can be very unreliable in his dealings with people. For example, last November 2017, the crown prince rounded up dozens of members of Saudi Arabia's political and business elite, some of whom were potentially uh, royal family rivals and others who were relatives that he thought were threats uh, to him and his family. And he ordered that they all be arrested in uh, the Ritz-Carlton Hotel in Riyadh. He accused them of taking bribes and uh, raising the costs of business projects. And um, the people were released only after they gave billions and billions of dollars to a new body, which the crown prince set up. It sounds like the crown prince has a history of behaving irresponsibly then. Yes, he does. And he's been involved in a lot of scandals. So Israel is understandably in a very difficult position right now. On one hand, they rely on Saudi Arabia as they're central to their strategy in the region. And now with a new technology deal, we see Saudi Arabia also relies on Israel. So Israel should proceed deliberately and cautiously. And uh, only time will tell how the Khashoggi murder has impacted Saudi-Israel ties and whether the balance of power has shifted in the Middle East. All right, Yael, thank you so much for your report. Thank you, Aaron. It seems like Halloween costumes have taken a dark spin again this year, as first a discussion of blackface Halloween costumes being okay on a morning talk show ultimately resulted in Megyn Kelly getting fired from NBC. And now it seems like a Nazi sympathizer from Kentucky is insulted by the treatment he and his family received after he and his five-year-old son dressed up as a Nazi SS officer and Hitler. Bryant Goldbach posted on Facebook that he saw people dressed as murderers, devils, and serial killers, and no one seemed to be bothered. But when he and his son dressed up as historical figures, they received threats and snide remarks. Quote, yes, liberalism is alive and well, Goldbach wrote, but it should be noted that this isn't a case of an attempt to squash freedom of speech. Rather, it was an expected response to the offensive sight of Goldbach dressed head to toe in a Nazi SS officer's uniform, standing next to his five-year-old son dressed as Hitler at a local trick-or-treat event. After the image went viral, Goldbach pulled the post from Facebook and later apologized for the costume choices, acknowledging that they were in bad taste. But Rabbi Gary Mazo from Temple of Dayat B'nai Israel in Edensville, Indiana, put it simply, that obviously, quote, if your costume calls to mind an event where millions of people were killed, choose another costume, end quote. But even Goldbach's apology and explanation that he simply loves history couldn't stand on its own legs, when after a cursory look at his likes on social media, one can see that he is an ardent follower of pages like White Wing Politics, Feminism is Cancer, and Everything's Going to be Alt-Right. Further still, Orbach's wife is a known Holocaust denier, claiming that the mass media essentially invented the, quote, hollow hoax, and that, quote, there is no objective proof of the six million Jews Hitler supposedly murdered, end quote, and that if there really was a Holocaust, why does it have to be forced down our throats? Well, to answer her question, it's precisely to prevent situations like this. Now back to South America, where the second round of the general elections in Brazil were just held yesterday, and pro-Israel far-right Jair Bolsonaro became the newly elected president. With more than 55% of the votes, by the way, Bolsonaro won the presidency against left-wing workers' party Fernando Haddad, and Altivis Joy Gavijon is here with the update. Joy? Hi, Aaron. Well, this is a historic moment for Brazil and I would say for the world, considering that we're talking about the largest nation in Latin America. Now, after the elections that were held yesterday, Bolsonaro became the most extremist and far-right leader in the region. This is a man who has made many homophobic and racist comments throughout his career, someone who has celebrated Brazil's military dictatorship and has even promoted torture. So then again, how is it that Bolsonaro got the majority of the votes after he made all these terrible comments? Well, the thing is that Brazil is currently going through a very hard time. 
the country is facing a deep economic recession and a, corru a corruption scandal involving former workers President Lula da Silva and also has one of the highest rates, rates on violent crimes in the world. So when Bolsonaro presented himself as a change and promised, promised solutions like giving police more authority to kill suspects and easing restrictions on gun possession for civilians to defend themselves, the voters who are tired of the situation in the country and afraid of the violence went for it. I see. And I mean, I can only imagine that his policies are uh, also going to reflect worldwide. You know, this, this yes. uh, including Israeli-Brazilian relations, most likely, I'm, I'm assuming. Yeah, you're right. You're right. The main question that everyone is asking right now in Israel is, is Brazil going to be the next country to move its embassy to Jerusalem? Well, we don't know for sure what's going to happen, but yeah, I think what, we're jumping the gun. <laughs> yes, but we do know that this was one of the promises that Jair Bolsonaro made during his campaign. And he even said that he intends to close the Palestinian embassy in Brasilia because he doesn't recognize Palestine as a country. Wow. And how, how, did he, how did his stand on Israel affect the Jewish community in Brazil and the Brazilian community in Israel then? Well, apparently the Jewish community in Brazil was very divided, but officially the president of the Jewish Federation in Rio endorsed Bolsonaro saying that he would be a great president. I mean, we saw Israeli flags during the celebrations in Sao Paulo and Brasilia. Sure. But for the Brazilian voters in the Holy Land, the position was a lot more unified, and Bolsonaro got more than 77% of the votes. Wow, so he's actually more popular here than he was even in Brazil. Yes, exactly. All right, well, we're definitely going to be following this very closely to see what his policies regarding Israel will be. We'll find uh, out on January 1st when he takes office. Yeah, and when that happens, we'll see you again. Thanks for the update, Joy. Thank you. Moving on, Tel Aviv University has announced that it will become the first of four founding partners in a new network of technology and innovation centers that are set to be built in Chicago, collectively known as the Discover Partners Institute. The Discover Partners Institute will be composed of a series of virtually connected hubs throughout Illinois, and it will serve as an entrepreneurship and innovation lab in the fields of computer science, artificial intelligence, cybersecurity, and big data. Tel Aviv University will operate labs, classrooms, and offices at these hubs for undergraduate and graduate students, as well as even for faculty for their studies and research. The project is based on a public and private collaboration between the University of Illinois, University of Chicago, Northwestern University, and now Tel Aviv University. And the total cost of the project is estimated to be $1.2 billion. As of now, the state of Illinois allocated $500 million for the initiative and the rest of the funds are set to be raised in the private sector. The university said in a statement that there will be a strong emphasis in building new companies, linking between startups and venture capital, and establishing connections between new firms and more established ones in the same industry. So if you're a burgeoning entrepreneur, make sure to check it out. Now, just after Israeli judokas Gili Cohen, Baruch Shimalov, and Timna Nelson Levy made history this weekend, snagging bronze in their weight classes at the UAE's Abu Dhabi Grand Slam. Veteran Israeli judoka Sagi Muki has now also made history, defeating Belgium's Matthias Kass for the gold. But of course, that's not all. As mentioned before, Israelis have appeared at similar events in the Arab Gulf in the past, but for years their participation was limited, and Israeli national anthems or symbols were banned. But not this year. This year, not only was the flag of Israel proudly displayed on Sunday, Israel's national anthem Hatikva was played for the first time ever in the United Arab Emirates. Further, during the anthem, Culture and Sports Minister Miri Regev openly wept and wrote on social media, quote, We made history. The people of Israel live, end quote. She then credited the International Judo Federation President Austria's Marius Weiser for influencing the organizers to change their policy on Israeli symbols. Abu Dhabi's hosting rights were revoked for their discriminatory practices last year until September, when the UAE promised to allow full participation for all competing delegations. And then now, in yet another judo first for Israel, the Jewish state has even secured hosting rights for the International Judo Federation's 2019 Grand Prix event. Mr. Regev said, quote, everyone is invited. Now, in a little update to that story, Peter Palchik, another Israeli judoka, has just won gold in Abu Dhabi. So congratulations, Peter, uh, and good luck to the rest of you in the Grand Slam. Now, moving back to Pittsburgh, after the horrific and absolutely devastating shooting that took 11 lives at the Tree of Life Synagogue on Saturday, Jewish and non-Jewish celebra celebrities have also publicly stated their shock and condolences with the world, as well as their support in the greater effort to finding peace and unity amongst our society. While TV's Emmanuel Kadosh is here with more, 
I am Emmanuel. Thanks, Aaron. This has been such a crazy World One weekend for everyone around the world. News of the shooting shook everyone to their core. Not to forget that this all happened on the Jewish Day of Rest and Prayer, Shabbat of all days. Tons of celebrities from all around the globe have come out to publicly share their state of shock and devastation, along with, you know, an optimistic message of equality, peace, acceptance. And of course, our very own Wonder Woman, Gal Gadot, posted on social media on Sunday, quote, all of humanity is connected to the same tree of life, referencing the name of the synagogue where the shooting had occurred. Actress and Jewish activist Deborah Messing was, of course, devastated, but also furious at the same time, saying, quote, please don't let their deaths be in vain. Make a commitment to take action on their behalf. We owe them that. The shooting must stop. You know. All right, well, yeah, I mean, I actually read Deborah Messing's post, and, and she was not shy about pointing fingers at President Trump, though, either. Yeah, she wasn't too shy from sharing the fact that the shooter, Robert Bowers, blamed the Jews for supporting people who come to the United States to seek asylum and went on to say that, quote, what could have possibly incited these mentally ill people to take action? I wonder. Well, we're all taught in kindergarten that words can hurt and have and have consequences, and we see that everywhere now. But Messing was not the only one who showed her unwavering support for the Tree of Life community. Actress and author Mayim Bialik expressed her solidarity with the Pittsburgh, with the Pittsburgh Jewish community. And actress girls created. Creator uh, Lena Dunham shared a post on Twitter. Scandals Josh Molina and Seinfeld star Jason Alexander also expressed their devastation and sadness. Yes. You know, tons of tons of celebrities yeah. are coming out with it. Uh, I've, I've noticed though that a lot of these posts were less about just condolences though and held a political message, right. primarily calling for stricter gun control policies in the wake of the shooting. That's right. Broadway star Ben Platt made one of the most, in my opinion, moving remarks. He posted to Twitter saying, quote, we can't go to the movies, we can't go to church, we can't go to synagogue, we can't go to a mosque, we can't go to a concert, we can't go to school, we can't go to work, so we have to go to the polls. And I think that this, you know, just is so necessary to post and to share. It's just such a raw and real perspective of our, of our reality. We really can't, you know, feel safe anywhere. None of us, not just Jews. All right. Well, I mean, that's that's what I believe the terrorists would want us to feel. So I, I, for one, am not buying into it just yet. Um, but on another note, you know, from what I understand, it's not just Jewish celebrities and organizations who are publicly speaking out about right. this either. Right, that's right, Aaron Tarr. Happy surprise, the Muslim American community has raised tens of thousands of dollars in crowdfunding effort to help wow. the victims of the of Pittsburgh shooting. Tariq El Masedi, a Muslim American speaker and founder of Celebrate Mercy, posted on Twitter saying, quote, Muslims. Let's stand with our Jewish cousins against hate, bigotry, and violence. The original goal of $25,000 was raised in only six hours. The new goal was raised to $50,000, and now the page has raised the goal to $125,000 uh, and has already raised over $114,000 as of what I just saw last. That's incredible. Yeah. All right, well, for me, that was definitely, yeah, that, that was one of the most moving parts, for too, sure. seeing so many people of opposing phase of, you know, people who are supposedly pinned against each other rising society, above right. yeah and supporting one another in a real time of need uh you know i love that people really responded to this in a productive way in a positive Definitely. way uh and i'm sure that they received a lot of backlash at times but at the end of the day you know there these are the, the people, site is still up they're still right, raising these money. are the people who are the ones that are taking the steps to bridge the gaps between the two religions and the cultures and the peoples uh, and I, I really think we should take time to appreciate that for sure um anyway ILTV t the iltv team also sends their condolences to the families uh, and everyone involved um, Thanks for the update, Emmanuel. Thank you. And now for our Hebrew word of the day. As the world commemorates the victims of the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh this week, so too shall our word of the day today be Askara, meaning commemoration. Now, as the name might suggest, an Askara, or commemoration, is a special ceremony where participants honor events or people that they've lost or otherwise want to honor, uh, or to lisko, or to remember. Well, now here on our own ILTV Askara, we'd like to offer our heartfelt condolences to the families and friends of the lost and injured. No one should ever have to fear for their lives just for existing. And this gross assault on Saturday has nothing to do with Trump or Clinton or anyone else uh, other than a pure racist hatred and intolerance. So my commemoration or Askara message to remember Oliskor is this. Robert Bowers and those who think like him and act like him are vile, racist monsters. And the only way to overcome vile, racist hatred is with tolerance and dialogue. So please don't let this split us apart. We're better than that. Now let's go ahead and take a look at the weather forecast. Tonight should be clear to partly cloudy and with a low of 66 or 19 degrees Celsius. Then tomorrow you can expect sunny skies and a slight rise in temperatures to a high of around 86 or 30 degrees Celsius. All right, that's it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.70 shekels to the American dollar. 
Remember to sign up for our daily newsletter at ILTV.TV, and don't forget to follow us on Facebook at Israel English News and on Twitter at ILTV News. I'm Aaron Porras. Thank you for watching.